so i think it's close to 715 it's it's about 716 right now um and and i i think we have uh, members who have logged in uh, at the outset uh, i'd like to thank uh, bandra jim uh, dr sheril uh, and her her team of volunteers who seem to be working very strongly and enthusiastically uh, at at helping people in the community i think there's morris there's uh, there's morris there's uh, elton uh, i would like to thank them uh, for being uh, invested in trying to help the community um and for inviting me this evening to answer your questions and 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 try to bring about a little bit of calm in the midst of uh, the panic that seems to be all around right now uh i will just give you a broad overview of what the situation currently is uh, i think a lot of us know about no technical details about the virus i think there's an information overload uh in terms of what we already know about uh the virus and things like that so i i wouldn't focus too much on the science of it um i i would run you through the steps in terms of what are the symptoms that you need to watch out for what are the things that you should do if you do if you do have any of those symptoms uh what are the potential things that might happen if you do get positive what are the things uh that one needs to remember in the event of somebody getting positive uh and just look at it in a calm and collected way rather than uh think about this in in a panic uh modality in which everyone seems to be extremely scared of things and and everyone's living in this constant fear uh so let's so i'm i'm dr lancelot pinto uh, i am a consultant chest physician at the hinduja hospital mahim and the hinduja healthcare hospital in khar uh i am one of the four consultants who is currently managing the covid ward at hinduja when we started we started uh, with with a few patients uh, but gradually over the past couple of months those numbers have increased uh we will eventually have a capacity of close to 100 patients uh, in our hospital uh including i intensive care and and regular beds uh so four of us consultants run uh, a covid ward uh and what i'm going to do is share some of my experiences in terms of the kinds of patients who come to us um and and what to kind of expect uh in the overall scheme of things so let's let's begin with what are the symptoms that we commonly see uh with covid uh i think one of the things that can't be said enough is that is that somewhere between 60 to 80% Uh, of all people with the disease will have zero symptoms so absolutely asymptomatic you won't even realize that you have the infection the infection will come and go away uh and maybe somewhere down the road when we have some sort of antibody test you will test yourself and you will suddenly be surprised at the knowledge uh that you have antibodies which which would mean that you've been infected in the past at some point of time so this is a good 60 to 80% uh, of the people of of all of us uh so that's a very reassuring figure so if 100 people do get covid 60 to 80% of people will not even realize that they have it so already uh that's a reassuring statistic right so in terms of in terms of the virus so the virus isn't as bad as uh, one would think about uh in in terms of its virulence it's not like a virus you know there are certain viruses like ebola for example which if you do get your probability of survival is 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 low it's it's the odds are against you or it's a 50 50 this is not that kind of a virus 80% of individuals 60 to 80% of individuals will have zero symptoms if you do have symptoms uh, the common symptoms that we see are fever uh fever can range from you know we have some individuals who presented with like a fever in the range of 100 or so but we've also had individuals who have this continuous fever which ranges in the range of 100 to 102 uh which seems to not go away easily so and we've seen people have this fever uh for as long as 10 days to 2 weeks sometimes uh by and large most individuals who have fever will have fever for about 4 or 5 days and then it kind of settles uh spontaneously uh so fever seems to be the commonest symptom that we are seeing uh the other common symptoms that we are seeing is a bit of a sore throat a bit of a throat irritation uh some individuals have a cough uh which tends to be a dry hacking cough uh not the kind of cough where you produce a lot of mucus uh individuals uh also present to us with shortness of breath so shortness of breath is clearly something that you should not ignore uh that would mean that 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 things are more uh than mild that 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 something needs to be done in terms of putting you under observation or admitting you etc uh so this is kind of the spectrum that we see there are also individuals we've seen who present with diarrhea so diarrhea seems to be a symptom uh that happens uh reasonably commonly in people with covid as well uh usually in the context of fever and diarrhea not not generally diarrhea alone uh based on what we've seen so far so again breaking it up 80% individuals 60 to 80% of individuals no symptoms 
most of the other individuals who do have symptoms will just have a fever and nothing else uh, the fever can stay for some time usually spontaneously goes away nothing nothing really uh, needs to be done about it in the sense of uh, of, of treating you with antibiotics etc uh, so let's put you through a sequence now. So let's say you know you wake up one one fine day in in the next week, and you wake up with a fever. You know, so the question arises in your mind: Could this be COVID? Uh, let's assume the answer to be yes. This is COVID. So is there something to really panic about? Is there something to be really scared about? No. The answer to that is no. So even if you do have COVID, even if you're in that thirty to forty percent who do have symptoms. Uh, the probability is very high that you will have a mild course. You will just get fever for some time. The fever will spontaneously go away. People who have a little more severe course will very often get a little bit of a cough, might be breathless, might need a little bit of oxygen for some time. Uh, but most individuals by and large seem to recover very, very well. Uh, and this has been our experience uh, at, at our hospital as well. Most of the individuals who have been admitted to our ward uh, have remained in the ward and have got discharged from the ward. It's a very small proportion of individuals who need to be moved from the ward to the ICU, who then on, who then may go on to develop complications. So again, you know, the way we, we view everything in life in terms of how to be scared uh, is in terms of probability. So what is the probability of me having a really bad outcome from an event? So if you talk about if you jump off a cliff without a parachute, the probability of something bad happening is very high. This is nowhere close to anything like that. You know, so. I, I think that's very reassuring and that's getting more and more reassuring as we move through the epidemic. All over the world people are realizing it that for every one person that tests positive, there are possibly 10 out there in the community who are positive but who have who had no sim, uh, symptoms. The next question I get asked often is, is how does it spread? So there is evidence that the virus stays on surfaces. So there is evidence that it stays on plastic, on metal, on cardboard. Um, a study which was widely publicized says that it stays stays for about uh, somewhere between four to six hours on cardboard. It stays alive for somewhere up to a day on metal. It stays alive for somewhere up to three to four days on plastic. However, we are not absolutely certain that just it staying out there means that it would definitely get transmitted. By and large, we still believe that the commonest way in which it gets transmitted is person to person. Uh, and person to person in the form of droplets. So every time we breathe, every time we cough, every time we sneeze, human beings tend to produce a cloud of droplets around themselves. And when somebody inhales that cloud of droplets, that's, that's when you potentially can catch the infection, which is where the concept of staying at a distance comes from, which is where the concept of wearing a mask comes from. So if you stay at a distance of about six feet away from an individual, you are not in that cloud of droplets that an individual produces as a result of which you are less likely to inhale any of the droplets that the individual exhales. Similarly, if you're wearing a mask, you, if you're wearing a mask, you're less likely to infect others. So masks may not be great at preventing infection from others, especially the standard three ply or the cloth, cloth masks, but they are a great way of spreading or of preventing the spread of infection to others. So if you are infected and you don't have any symptoms, you don't even know that you're infected. If you are wearing a mask, you're very less likely to spread it to others. So the concept being if you and I are having a conversation, both of us are wearing masks, either of us could be infected, but we are kind of protecting the other person by wearing a mask. So I, I think nothing can be emphasized more uh, as the importance of wearing masks all the time, especially when you're outdoors. Um, the third thing that cannot be emphasized enough is hand washing. You know, So people ask me questions like, do we really need to wash our vegetables in soap water? Do we need to be paranoid about every surface we touch? The answer to that is let's assume that it's on vegetables. Even if it is on vegetables, the way you are going to get it from that vegetables is still touching the vegetable and then touching your face. So as long as you keep your hands away from your face, as long as you keep washing your hands throughout the day, even if it is on surfaces and even if that's a way in which it can spread, you will not catch it as long as you don't touch your face or touch your nose. Uh, which is why masks also come in handy when you're going outside because the very the very act of wearing a mask prevents you from touching your face. So say you go outside to a grocery store, say the handle of that grocery store, say the handle of the door to that grocery store um, has virus on it. If you are wearing a mask, even if you touch it and you don't touch your face after that, you are not going to catch the virus. You know, you need to therefore frequently wash your hands. So every time you come from outside, you come back home, 
you need to make sure you wash your hands every time you go outside you need to make sure you wear a mask uh, and i think these are the strongest tools against uh, catching the virus um washing stuff obsessively you know trying to completely uh, control the situation by going overboard uh, i think is something that leads to more panic leads to more anxiety uh, and and i think keeping the instructions simpler uh is much easier to follow than 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 trying to create a complex sterile environment around you you know viruses are something that are there everywhere uh, and and trying to control uh that story the, the story of where the virus is where it is you know how many surfaces you need to sterilize around you is much more difficult than controlling yourself you know washing your hands wearing a mask preventing touching uh, touching your face i think these are the most important things um also there is that you know based on the numbers that we are seeing um, i think it would be fair to assume all over the world that most individuals will get in- infected over the next year or two uh, the idea of preventing that infection or the idea of pushing that infection to the future is that let's say 2 months down the road there is a miracle drug that comes out let's say 6 months to a year down the road there is a vaccine that comes up so you would want to try and push your infection to a state where there is some sort of a protection which is available either in the form of a drug or a vaccine and i think that's the key that's the that's the primary reason why we should all do our bit to postpone the infection i don't think we are going to succeed in trying to completely avoid uh, the the viral infection by and large uh, so be sensible in what you're doing but i don't think we should go completely overboard such that it leads to a lot of anxiety and it messes with your mental health at the end of the day which can have its own manifestations um so let's move on to the next step so i woken up in the morning with a fever uh what do i do next uh the ideal thing to do next is to get yourself swabbed to get get a nasopharyngeal swab so the swab has to be the nose and the throat a throat swab alone is not very good it will miss about 70% of infections it has to be the nose and the throat and and i think most labs are doing it right now uh how do you get to a lab how do you get to getting the swab is through a doctor unfortunately you will not be able to walk into a lab directly and say that i want a swab so you will need to contact your doctor uh the unfortunate part as of now is that the bmc does not allow a doctor to prescribe that swab over the phone or over teleconsultations so you will unfortunately have to physically see a doctor who will write that prescription put the stamp on it and justify the reason why why the swab is being done so it's a standardized form which is there from the bmc which all the labs provide where the doctor tick marks says okay this person has fever this person has a sore throat and therefore needs a swab uh you get the swab done usually the turnaround time is about a day nowadays so within a day usually you will get the result uh, of the swab so for people in bandra uh, i'm sure the labs do it hinduja is also an option if you want to get a swab done you can present to the emergency department in hinduja with a prescription for a swab uh and and we can do it uh, uh at hinduja now the next possibility two things will happen either your test comes positive or your test comes negative if your test comes negative unfortunately it does not mean that you do not have covid the test picks up about 70% of individuals who have covid it misses about 30% of individuals so what i would suggest is if the test comes negative and you just have fever for example you don't have any other symptoms like breathlessness you seem otherwise fine uh the main thing would be to then prevent the infection spreading to others in your family so try and quarantine yourself as much as possible um put yourself in a room uh with an attached toilet uh so that you don't interact with other people protect the elderly in your family especially if you have elderly people and you're a young person if you are say the person who's been doing groceries etc you protected the elderly and now you have a fever uh just make make sure as much as you can that you don't spread it to them because they are the most vulnerable in this disease uh so to i would strongly suggest that you self quarantine for a minimum of 10 days uh if your swab is negative now if your swab comes positive it means you have a covid infection again i don't think there's any reason to panic or to fear uh the bmc right now is allowing people to home quarantine so you can just choose to quarantine yourself at home as long as you have a room with an attached toilet so if you have a room with an attached toilet uh the bmc lets you home quarantine they also have other criteria you need to ideally be under 60 uh you need to not have any comorbidities which means that you can't be a patient who has really severe diabetes 
or you have heart disease or you have any other comorbidity that puts you at a slightly higher risk uh, in which case they may not let you uh, quarantine at home uh, as as citizens of the community i would strongly so one of the first things that i did was was speak to my uh, building secretary and say that we should strongly encourage people to home quarantine if they can uh and i and i think that's something that we should all accept as a community we should not stigmatize individuals who live within the community and who choose to home quarantine uh i'm hearing more and more stories from the community of individuals who chose to home quarantine and that made everybody in their society paranoid everybody scared everybody give them a tough time uh everybody find it difficult uh, to live with the concept that somebody in their society is positive so if a person is positive and is quarantining themselves at home i see no reason why anybody in that society uh, should be afraid of that individual so that individual is not going to transmit that virus by staying at home uh, in a society uh, so i think we should not give individuals a tough time in fact you should put yourself in your own shoes that some day you might be in that similar situation and you might need to home quarantine and i think it's important to encourage uh, people to home quarantine because at the end of the day the home is the most comfortable place uh, and the home is where most individuals um, uh will be most comfortable and most calm uh the other questions okay so if you need to get hospitalized if you are an elderly person if your oxygen levels are low if you are breathless if you have a severe cough which seems to be the case you will need to be hospitalized um uh the hospital and there are there are again two categories of this there are categories where you where you will be allowed to get admitted to a hospital or there is a category in which you will be allowed to get admitted to a quarantine center uh which is kind of a step down from a hospital where you will have a doctor who will monitor you you will have somebody who will monitor you during the course of a day uh and you will be then shifted to a hospital if at any point of time they feel you're 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 on the edge uh but otherwise you will be allowed to stay in a quarantine center which uh, would be one of the halls so i think you know places like nsci for example is a hall uh and there are similar goregaon sports complex i think there are there are a bunch of halls which are available uh in the city which the bmc has taken over which are supervised by doctors uh but but are not hospitals because you don't need the care uh that that a hospital will provide that also helps us keep our beds in the hospital for individuals who are really sick and who need to be in a hospital if you need admission to a hospital that's where it can get a little challenging and that's where uh, i think dr sheril and her team uh have been very kind enough to set up a cell which will do their best to try and get you a hospital bed uh, a useful number to remember is 1916 Uh, that's the bmc official helpline you can call them up you can tell them that you've been tested positive and you really need a bed you can tell them that you have a preference of a private healthcare versus a public healthcare if you do have such a preference uh, and they will do their best to find you a bed and and that's a useful resource because honestly they are the people who really know what the bed situation across the city is uh calling up individual hospitals and trying to get beds can be challenging uh but that's where you know if you have the resources of a bunch of volunteers who who are who are happy to do that uh to help you out i think i think that's that's very useful uh, uh uh to have to help you uh find a bed uh if you do get admitted to a hospital again most of what we are doing is ob- observe patients there is no drug as of now which is shown to be conclusively proven to help uh in covid uh at hinduja for example we are part of a couple of drug trials where we are going to be testing different drugs as part of a trial where you will be vol- asked to volunteer in a trial uh but as as a routine standard of care uh, we don't really have any drugs which make a huge difference uh to the outcomes of 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 individual patients most people need observation most people need oxygen uh most people need a little more than oxygen uh if if they need help with breathing uh so most of what we do even at hospitals is just making sure that everything else is under control so people's sugars are under control if they are diabetic people's blood pressure is under control and they given oxygen uh if they need oxygen um so that's as far as what to do if you have symptoms what to do if you turn positive what to do if you turn uh negative uh a few questions that people tend to ask me is any are there any food supplements are there any diets are there any things that they can do uh to help themselves prevent the disease Unfortunately the answer to that is is we really don't know you know i mean most of the stuff almost every day you're going to get messages on whatsapp saying this is good saying try zinc try vitamin c try you know a bunch of different vitamins try vitamin d uh and and you know what i tell most of my patients is that if you're reasonably certain that the drug can do no harm there's no harm in trying it there's no harm in trying vitamins there's no harm in trying home remedies 
as long as you are confident that it's not going to come cause any harm what i would strongly not recommend is using drugs like hydroxychloroquine which you know went out of stock after president trump announced something about it but but most of our studies are telling us right now that hydroxychloroquine is a pretty useless drug uh, for treatment the icmr has it on its list of drugs for prophylaxis uh, but you know i i uh, that's not meant for everybody in any case that's meant only for health healthcare workers and individuals uh, at a high risk of exposure so i would not i would strongly not recommend using any drugs that people tell you might help uh, what you may use is, a, is is whatever whatever vitamin cocktail uh, that will cause no harm and will for whatever it's worth boost your your immunity i think what's very important uh, uh, in this in these times is also your mental health people focus a lot on physical health and physical symptoms uh, but being quarantined all the time being uh, cooped up at home being constant in, constantly in a state of paranoia can cause mental health issues <clears throat> and i think you should seek help uh, if if you think you are depressed you should seek help if you think uh, you are very anxious um and i think again you know that's where you you reach out to friends and family there are a lot of psychiatrists who are doing teleconsults <clears throat> and can really help so uh, i i think you know what's really important uh, and you know which is the theme which is one of the reasons why i wanted to do this talk and and is is to tell to tell everyone out there uh, to stay calm i i know it's very difficult to stay calm because all around you whether it comes to news media whether it comes to whatsapp whether it comes to social um media all around you it seems like we are in the middle of a war zone the numbers are increasing uh, you need to keep remembering and keep reminding yourself that the numbers are the numbers of those who are infected and you need to keep reminding yourself that most of those who are infected will have no problems whatsoever they will they are infected they've turned positive on a test that doesn't mean that bad things are going to happen to them so even if the numbers rise as long as the number of severe infections as long as the number of individuals on ventilators etc uh, stay under control uh, there's really nothing to be to be absolutely paranoid uh, or worried about and i think that's that's something that we need to constantly keep in perspective so the numbers are going to increase they're probably going to keep increasing over the next few days uh, but but i don't really think we should panic and and i think uh, you know we have a whole flow chart in place we have a whole thought process in place what are we going to do at every single step that's what i've tried to outline in this talk today uh, and you have support you know a lot of people in the city unfortunately do not have support uh, but with the support that you're getting from the community uh, i i think that's that's very very uh, important and useful um okay so i just realized somebody just pointed out that my settings are are from friends to public uh, hopefully this talk will get recorded uh in any case uh, you know we plan on doing a follow up talk uh, sometime next week with all the queries that remain unanswered um and i'm happy to you know you can you can forward your queries uh, to uh, the bandra gym uh, president uh, and you know they will collate the questions for me and i'll be happy to do another session which will just address all the queries uh, uh, uh which people may have uh, after this talk as well uh i think that's that's a broad summary that i wanted a broad gist or a broad summary of the situation that i wanted to convey to everyone here uh i hope everyone is reassured that it's not as bad as people uh, think it may be i hope everyone is reassured that most of us myself included i'm at the front lines dealing with patients every day uh so myself included most of us are going to come out of this unscathed we are going to come out of this strong we are going to come out of this uh with with no uh no major physical or emotional damage uh and i and i think that's the bottom line uh so you know with that i'm going to sign off for the day i suggest i i hope everyone stays safe stay stays calm uh and i wish you all the best